Hello, my dear friends. I am going to take you through three different sections of the book of Luke, and we're going to compare them to Matthew's Olivet Discourse so that I can show you guys that part of what people believe is about the church and the rapture in Luke 21 is very far off base. First and foremost, this is where dispensationalism helps to draw boundaries, and there should be boundaries drawn because this helps us understand who Jesus was talking to, when he was talking to them, and time periods he was prophesying about. When you have no boundaries, everything just, it's like anything goes, and you can make a case for anything. And that's so difficult to study the Bible with no boundaries. So Jesus died for the sins under the Old Covenant and permanently shut the Old Covenant up and instituted the New Covenant whereby the dispensation of the grace of God began, which was a mystery before its revelation. And the end of that dispensation was also a mystery before its revelation. Paul gave those both. So Jesus is not going to be talking about the dispensation of the grace of God, although he did reference it, but very minutely uh, in certain places, none of which we're going to talk about here. Uh, he was talking to Israel about the end of the period of time they were presently in and about the period of time that was in the future, the capstone of prophecy, which is Jesus' second coming. Matthew 24 and 25 are Matthew's Olivet Discourse, both chapters. Matthew 24 is very specifically correlative to Revelation 6 through 19. It begins with the seals. The opening of seals 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6, and Jesus says all these are the beginning of sorrows, which correlates to Revelation 6's opening of seals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, except 5 is not judgment related, it's salvation related, which is why Jesus doesn't talk about it in the Olivet Discourse. But it plainly says when seals 1 through 6 are open, Jesus, just like Jesus said, all these are the beginning of sorrows, John in Revelation writes, the great day of his wrath is come, who shall be able to stand? So then Jesus moves into what will happen to Israel, which is not great stuff during the first half. They'll be persecuted. And then it goes into the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, which is tied to trumpet seven, which then precipitates an abomination of desolation, which Jesus also picks up on, talks about the flight of the remnant. When ye shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So you have midpoint of the week events there. And then he goes into the description of the rise of the beast and the false prophet. It says, there shall arise false Christ and false prophet shall deceive many, insomuch that if, if, if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. And he says, don't believe it if people say, go there, the Messiah is here, or go here, the Messiah is here. He says, what the second coming is actually going to look like is lightning coming from the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And that is Revelation 19. So Matthew 24 is a very uh, encapsulated overview of the signs of Jesus' coming, which are 70th week specific, and the second coming itself. So people believe that, and I'm not sure which chapter in Mark it is. I think it's Mark 13, but I could be wrong. Uh, Matthew and Mark have basically the same almost word-for-word -word accounts. Luke is different. But people automatically assume that Luke 21 is the same Olivet Discourse as was given in Matthew 24. It's not. And if we actually read the chapter, we'll learn that. See, Matthew 24 is 70th week specific. When I say that, it is specifically related to Daniel 9.27. Luke 21 is specifically related to Daniel 9, 26. Let's show you how. And we're going to start by comparing scriptures here, Matthew 24 and Luke 17. In this video, we're going to go through three different chapters in Luke. Luke 17, Luke 19, and Luke 21. Because Luke 21 is the fulfillment of the prophecy against Israel that Jesus gave in Luke 19, which prophesied about the 70, the 70 AD events. So that's why I say Luke 21 
while there might be very minimal reference to the 70th week, it backs off of that and says, but before all those things, and then goes into the account of 70 AD. So Matthew 24 and Luke 21 are related to Daniel 9.27 and Daniel 9.26. They're talking about two very different events, even if the language used is similar. So I'm going to hopefully clear up some misconceptions out there by starting with Matthew 24 and showing you where it aligns in the book of Luke. Matthew 24, 23. This is after the abomination of desolation, after the flight of the remnant. This correlates to Revelation 13 with the rise of the two beasts, the first and the second, which are the beast and the false prophet. If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophet, shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Why will it not be possible? Because the elect were taken on the wings of great eagle into the wilderness and were placed where she is going to be nourished for a time times half a time from the face of the serpent. The serpent who gives power to the first and second beast. He says, Behold, I have told you. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. If he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as lightning cometh from the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then Jesus is coming back. Everyone's going to mourn because they see him coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He's going to send his angels, give them the command to pick up the remnant from wherever they're scattered per Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 5. And then there are parables likening this, these events to the days of Noah. God shut Noah in the ark. As soon as the door closed, the rain came and judgment swept people away. Well, as soon as Jesus comes, the door shut on salvation and anyone who is not a believer is going to be swept away in judgment or burned in fire in Armageddon. Parable of those uh, workers in the field, one taken, the other left. The one taken is kept out of the kingdom. The one left is the one going into the kingdom. This correlates to Matthew 13 with the angels being the reapers and the end of the world. They're gathering the, the tares out of the kingdom. I'm not going to go through all those verses, but it's Matthew 24, 30, uh, 23 through 51, the end of the chapter. Go ahead and read those. So we come to the same thing in Luke 17. Starting in verse 23, they shall say unto you, see here, or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as lightning, uh, as the lightning that lighteth out of one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. First he must suffer many things, be rejected of this generation. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. The flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it, and the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. These are the same things. So this is the, from the rise of the beast and false prophet to the second coming and the parables that follow from Matthew 24 is found in Luke 17, not in Luke 21, Luke 17. So let's go ahead and go to, let's see, Matthew 24, 4 through 22. And then we're going to go to Luke 21. So this is the first part of, in Matthew 24, when his disciples came to him privately on the Mount of Olives, said, What will be the signs of thy coming at the end of the world? And Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, shall deceive many. Seal one. Ye shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation. Seal two. There shall be famines. Seal three. Pestilences. Seal four. And earthquakes in diverse places. Seal six. All these are the beginning of sorrows. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted, kill you, be hated of all nations for my name's sake. 
Uh, fast forward to verse 17. This is trumpet 7. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then the end shall come. This is uh, correlated to Revelation 10, 7. In the, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Finished means revealed. It's no longer a mystery when it's spoken. Uh, that is what the angel preaches in, Re in Revelation 14, 6, and 7. I heard another angel fly through the midst of the heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, every nation and people and kindred and tongue, crying with a loud voice, saying, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Okay, so, and then uh, in the midst of the week, there's going to be, cause the uh, sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Which is then captured by the flight of the remnant into the wilderness into her place where she's going to be nourished for a time, times, half time from the face of the serpent. Plainly it tells us that if anyone stays behind, they're going to die. Maybe not physically, but spiritually, because it very plainly says in the next verses, like I already showed you, that uh, there shall arise false Christ, false, uh, false Christ and false prophets, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Well, the ones that have scattered and gone to the wilderness will be taken care of. The ones who stay behind are going to die. Either they'll die because they refused or they'll die they'll die physically because they refused or they'll die spiritually because they didn't refuse. Let's head over to Luke 21. So in Luke 21 Six. This relates to the first several verses of Matthew 24 when they were leaving the temple and Jesus said, the, the disciples pointed out the, the temple. Or actually, let's see what. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple and Jesus said, See not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be here one stone left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, so that's where we're at. Some of, uh, some of his disciples spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. And Jesus said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. What did that relate to? The destruction of Jerusalem and the sacking of the city and the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. They asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what will there be when these things shall come to pass? He said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. The time draweth near, go ye not after them. Okay? Matthew 24, right? This picks us up with seal 1. Remember? Seal 1, seal 2, seal 3, seal 4, seal 6. All these are the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24. So what's he talking about here? Same things, right? When ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, famines, pestilences, fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Yep, that seals 1 through 4 and 6, just like he said in Matthew 24. Here's where they diverge. But before all these, this immediately tells you that the rest of the passage hasn't got a dang thing to do with the 70th week. It starts it out the same as Matthew's Olivet Discourse with the seals. And then he says before all these things, which means that what he is going to talk about has absolutely nothing to do with the 70th week. What's it got to do with? What he prophesied would happen to them in Luke 19. Luke 19, 42 through 44, is one of the direct results of Israel not knowing the timing of the king coming to bring the kingdom. They rejected the triumphal entry, and they selected the lamb for Passover four days later. When 
Jesus was aware of their rejection. He prophesied the events of 70 AD as a recompense against Israel for not receiving him. He said, saying, Thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So Luke 21 starts off talking about the 70th week, and it backs off, and it talks about the specific instance of what he prophesied about in Luke 19. What's going to happen in the days where they come against Israel for the purpose of killing Israel and destroying the temple? The sacking of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Again, this is what is related specifically to Daniel 9, 26. And after, uh, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Desolations, the first in 70 AD, and the first, second, in the midpoint of the 70th week, both related to the temple. One would destroy the temple and leave in it one stone not left upon another, not left one stone upon another, and the second would just cause the remnant to flee and into safety for the last half of the 70th week. So Daniel 9.26 says, From 70 AD to the second coming, there are desolations determined regarding the temple in Israel. Luke 19 is the first one, which is embodied in Luke 21, with greater detail given. This is not 70th week. This is 70 AD, and we know that because it says before all these things. So from 70 AD to the second coming, this is what the rest of the chapter looks at. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end. Second coming. Desolations are determined. So this is the context of Luke 21 from verses 12 through the end. It's from 70 AD to the second coming of Christ. It has nothing specifically to do with the 70th week, although there are some things that are written in here that will occur within the 70th week. But this is specifically the point A to point B, 70 AD to second coming as given in Daniel 9.26. Before all those things, they shall lay their hands on you, persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogues and prisons, uh, bring you before kings and rulers, be for a testimony. You're going to be hated for all men's sake, uh, and your patience possess you, your souls. This is 70 AD, not 70th week. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know that the desolation thereof is nigh. What desolation? The one he prophesied in Luke 19, two chapters sooner. If thou hadst known, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come upon thee, the enemy shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Just like Daniel says, under the end of the war, desolations are determined. The first is here in Luke 21, 70 AD. You shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. Know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Not just the temple, the city. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Again, this is not the abomination of desolation midpoint. This is the flight of Israel out of Jerusalem at 70 AD. And let them which are in the midst depart thereof, and let them not that are, uh, let them... Let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance when all of these which are written may be fulfilled. Luke 19, 42 through 44. The days of vengeance were not knowing the time of their visitation. Woe unto them that are a child of them that good suck of those days. They shall be distressed in the land, wrath upon the people. They shall fall by the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. 
and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles are from 70 AD to the second coming. Uh, this is exactly what Paul writes about in Romans 11. I would not have you to be ignorant of this, brethren, that you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel from Luke 19 until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And at the time of the fullness of the Gentiles being come in, all Israel shall be saved. Second coming, as it is written, there shall come out a sign, the deliverer shall turn away in godliness from Jacob. Blindness is cast right here. The days of vengeance. If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. The casting of blindness and it'll be lifted just prior to the second coming and we know it'll be lifted just prior to the second coming because israel will come to saving knowledge literally three verses before jesus returns at the second coming it is that close for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled 70 a.d and from that point until the end Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, which is when Jesus comes back, destroys them all, and sets Israel atop the nation and the kingdom. And what is it going to look like at the second coming when he comes back and destroys the Gentiles and sets Israel atop the nations and the kingdom? There shall be signs in the sun, moon, stars, and, and uh, upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the wave roaring. That's Isaiah 24. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. That's talking about the second coming. Then they shall see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. When you see all these things come to pass, then look up and lift up your head, for your redemption draws nigh. Second coming. Signs. Signs of his coming and of the end of the world. Signs are not for us in this present dispensation, and the people who are looking for them are going to be disappointed, continually disappointed. Then he goes into the parable of the fig tree, which again has nothing to do with the church or this present dispensation. He says, this generation, the generation that sees the signs of the second coming and of the end of the world, which are 70th week specific and second coming, that generation shall not pass, so all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And the verse that people like to take way out of context, watch ye therefore and pray always. Who has to watch? Are people that ready and saved need to watch? No, because it doesn't matter when he comes, they're saved, they're going to go. Who do you need to tell to watch? People who aren't ready. And who would need to get ready when they see signs. He's speaking to unbelievers. Not his disciples specifically, but those who would read these from Israel and who would be on earth to see signs. Which means they're in a time period of judgment and wrath, which is not reserved for believers. That's who he's talking to. Watch. You only need to be told to watch if you have some, some situation you need to change to be ready. People think that watching is something that we're supposed to do all the time. No. People who are unsaved need to watch. If I'm going to be going somewhere, and I know somebody's coming to pick me up, I've got my shoes on, I've got, you know, coat, jacket, whatever, I've got my purse in my hand. I've, I've got my keys in my hand to lock the door. Does it matter if they show up in a minute or five or 10 or 12 hours? No, because I have everything that I need to, to walk out the door when they pull into my driveway. Would I need to be told to watch? No, I'm ready. But if someone is, is just standing around doing nothing and they're, you know, watching TV or they're, you know, don't have their shoes on, don't have their keys, they're, you know, not even dressed and ready to go. Somebody shows up, says, hey, get in the car, time to go. And they're like, oh, I'm not ready. Oh, sorry, can't wait around for you, gotta go, leave you behind. 
That's what it's talking about, is us believers who have Jesus in our hearts and we're sealed by the Spirit. Not a single one of us is given a command to watch for anything. We don't need to. We're already ready. The only people who are told to watch are unbelievers. I get more irritated than I should when people take this verse out of context and apply it to the church. Because this is the reason why you have all these people on all these forums constantly wasting the present life that they're given watching because like they take it very literally and be like, like they think they're going to miss it if they're not talking about it constantly or like looking up at the sky and the signs and like if I don't know what the mentality is here. But you don't have to like sit in your chair on a forum like talking yourself in circles about which day so that you you know exactly which day it is and so you you're standing outside ready waiting to go at the precise minute. Like maybe if you blink you'll miss it and and so you can't blink. You can't look away. I, this is it's discouraging and it makes me angry on behalf of people, not at people, but on behalf of people when they take these verses out of context and literally waste the lives they were given thinking that if they look away from the screen and the forum that they'll miss something. It's like a fear of missing out. That's exactly what it is, is a fear of missing out. Like, I got to be here and I got to know what the conversation is and I got to participate because if I don't, I'm not watching. Are you saved? Because if you are, then you don't need to watch. Anyway, if you guys have questions or comments, let me know. Luke 21 is Daniel 9.26 from 70 AD to the second coming. Matthew 24 is Daniel 9, 27, from the opening of seal 1 to the glorious appearing of Christ. They are not the same. And yet, they are both the same in that neither one of them has anything to do with the church or the rapture.